right. Praise God. Amen. Keep praying for uh, Steve in Pakistan. Sure, he's going to have a lot of things to tell us when he gets back. Pray um, for this Christmas coming up that the messages just be fresh and new over the holiday season. And. Um, and also pray we're um, starting to put together a um, a um, young adults uh, group, um, and it's starting to get a little traction. So we're excited about that and what God's going to be doing. But we need prayer, right? We need prayer in our different ministries and different things that we do um <clears throat> okay so we're in the um um the gifts of the spirit and um so i think maybe uh three more weeks um doesn't mean i can't go on because there's still a lot more but um it's the end of the semester <laughs> so um So we're just going to move a little bit. We're going to do an overview of some of these things now because we can't spend a lot of times like, I mean, if I was on something, I'd just park it, you know, but we can't now We because uh, there's a couple of things that we definitely need to cover. So today we're going to be, um, um, we're, uh, last week we were talking about the, the, diverse, the diversity of gifts. Um, and the varieties of the ministries and the, the and you know all the services you know we have verses we have chapters that break down these gifts but uh, the way I'm reading this is I think there's just even so much more uh, to the gifts of God that are given to his people and uh, everybody has a gift everybody's received a gift. A lot of people, they think they're absent from this, but they're not. They just, maybe it's not clear to them. And just pray, because God will make it, make it clear. Remember, there's a diversity of the gifts, but there's the same spirit. Remember, we hit all that last week. So if you didn't hear last week, uh, go into that. We talked about motivational gift, manifestational gift, operational gifts, and the ministry gifts, which are, in Ephesians chapter 4, okay? So why, though? Why is this? You know, why, you know, it's like um, gifts are given to the church. Gifts are given to the church. And um, and those gifts that are given, so it's like, um, you know, we have the, we have the church and, um, and the gifts are, whoop, can't go too high. Gifts are coming down from heaven to to the local church. Gifts are coming down, and then from the church they go out because I uh, okay. Gifts are coming down, and then they're going out, and this is. Uh, out here, it's it's um, um, within the church, within the body of Christ. Um, it is distributed within the body of Christ first. So the gifts are given to the church for the church for a purpose, and and they're basically it produces love within the church. There's no. Remember, all last week, the whole message was on unity. And, um, and there is no unity uh, with disagreement within the church. Separation happens within churches when there is no unity. And it's a sad thing. It really is. And, it's because, and sometimes it's, it's over 
this. <laughs> the church is being divided over the gifts that are given by God for the church, for the body. And, uh, so it's, it, it, it should be producing love within us. Um, there's great ministry th- that is going on. So remember it that so all the all the people within the church they they are spiritual beings okay so the gifts are for the spiritual beings when we're in unity with one another and um i remember we talked about i don't know if i talked about it last week because i did speak again about this uh, in the missions money because it was the same topic this unity but we are to guard that we are to guard what god has given us we are to guard unity above all things it even says i mean we are protect each other Uh, in other words um, people can easily get offended and so we have to guard that that doesn't happen no matter what and we are to make that like one of a top priority within the church because there is no growth if there is no unity. If there's not love between the church, there's no growth. You're not growing personally, and the church isn't growing as a whole. So, um, and and by the way, uh, the church growing in a whole, that's not numbers. That's maturity. Maturity is more important than numbers. Disciples are more important than numbers. People that are really wanting to hear God. You know, that's the importance. So that's what I'm talking about, growth. But, um, but that doesn't happen if there's disharmony. And, um, and I think even in Amos 2, and this is really misquoted, I think, in the church, it says, how can two walk together if they, don't dis- if they disagree? And that's, it can be two, but really it's me and God. So how can I walk with God if me and him are disagree? if I can't even agree with God? You know, I mean, that's how far we can sometimes get. And people, churches break up for the, for the, for the dumbest things and with no concern of people. No concern about the Spirit of God within the church. None at all. Because it's something that they want and they're pushing it. So it's the flesh pushing against it. So we must have, we must have unity within our church. So the church, within the church, there are spiritual living beings. They are, you are spiritual. If you receive the Holy Spirit, you are spiritual. And, and spiritual people receive spiritual gifts. The gifts are spiritual. They're not carnal. They're not fleshly. They're not for the natural. They're for the spiritual being. And you are a spiritual being. You are saved. And, 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 um, and, and you, are, you have been bought with a price. So... Let's uh, let's look into some of this stuff here. Um, I'm going to talk about um, three different gifts here, but really the emphasis is really only on one. And um, and remember, there's a distinction between the gifts of the spirit and the fruit of the spirit. You need to know it. You need to know that. Okay. Um, the fruit is happening within the believer and the gifts are what distributed outward to people. They're the outward manifestation and the fruit is an inward manifestation and, and they both contain love. Love is like the primary to both the gifts and the fruit because without love, what are you? Without love, your gift is noise. It, does, it doesn't produce anything. It doesn't produce anything. You are bragging and boasting on yourself. And remember last week? um, Let me see if I can find it. It could be Ephesians. um, Let me just check real quick. Because this is so, yeah, no. 
Yes, yeah. Okay, so uh, Ephesians 4, um, verse 2, he's talking about the unity of the Spirit, and then he's going to start talking about the gifts that are given to the church, and before that, he says, with all lowliness and meekness and long-suffering, forbear one another. Before the gifts, this, the gifts aren't given to make you proud and boastful and arrogant and to, to, to say, I've got this, what do you got? Not at all. Not, I mean, because they've, they're, they're received in humility. They are a gift of God. It even says that too. Verse 7, but to every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift. <laughs> it's all great. The gifts are given to the church because of grace, not because you're something, not because you deserve it. It's going to be for the building up of the church, and that is it. Once it starts to get arrogant and pride, now you are walking in them, and I would be, care- I would be very careful to say that that is from God. You know, because I would have to quit. Because here it says, it's done with, your gift that you receive should be in meekness and We don't deserve it, in other words. It's in meekness and lowliness. It's in humility and it's in love. The gift goes forward that way. So, um, so, so yeah, so we got the gift of the Spirit and we got the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit inward we was what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness. and So that is the fruit. That is the fruit. When we abide in the vine, we produce fruit. But they're also, um, I think, with that fruit, um, I think the gift has more clarity. I think it's very clear the direction that the church in receiving that starts to take. And we take that on. We take that on because Christ promised to give it to us. He said, you know, when I leave, you know, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send you another one. And really that word another is another just like me. And he will start to teach you and guide you and direct you as, as the church takes on a living being because that's what we're to do. And we come together in the church and we, we can operate in the gift as long as there's unity. There's no, there's, no, uh, there's no division. There's no division. It's harmony. There's, not, there's nothing that's unclear. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's not causing confusion. I've been to a lot of, and there's a lot of confusion. And it's not the spirit of God. God is not the author of confusion. There shouldn't be confusion in a, even in a service. So um, it's not that, uh, I mean, we want that freedom, but that freedom is, is God's grace too. Galatians 5.1. All right, so, um, and I'm not saying that the fruit is more important than the gifts. I've heard people say that. Uh, I, it's all from God, <laughs> you know. I mean, there. How do you label it, you know? But uh, but it's you know. Um, I would. Uh, I think in in that uh, breakdown of um, fruit and the gifts, uh, I think I would like to see more love. If we're seeing love within the church, God's moving. <laughs> God's moving. It's not by a feeling. It's God's love for one another. So, a little different. Okay? All right, so, 1 Corinthians 14. And um, I'm going to do 14 just a little bit here. And then um, next week, we're going to go back to 13. And there's a reason why I think it's so important. Um, but um, But this is a chapter that is really about two gifts the gift of tongues 
and the interpretation of tongues. But if you read that, it doesn't go there at all. It's not about that at all. I don't see it. It's mentioned, but there's something more important is what Paul's bringing out. Something that should be desired a lot more than these two gifts is how I'm reading this. So um, let's, let's look at this. Verse 1, and it says, follow after charity or follow after love and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy or prophecy. Now, so two things of this meaning of follow after charity. Chapter 13 is all about love. It's all about charity. So this is following that is what it says. Uh, uh, So with chapter 13, as it starts to lay that out, this also should follow that same principle that was taught in 13. And this will come into place but uh, of why I'm going this first. But anyway, um, so uh, to, this word uh, to follow means to pursue. We should be pursuing love above all cost, uh, even when it comes to all spiritual gifts. Does that make sense? If you don't, again, it's it's love is that, t- even the fruit of the Spirit, it starts with love. Love, joy, peace. So love is that first and everything flows from it. And same thing with the gifts. If you know, When we have love in our hearts, the gifts are just going to flow and we're going to operate in it properly with being in control, not out of control. So follow after love. Um... And desire spiritual gifts. Now, okay, so um, that word spiritual gifts, um, I don't know what translation you have, but that word gifts there should be in italics, right? You guys don't have your Bibles, does it? What 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 translation? Okay, so I know that does. I think English English Standard does too, and New King James too. So here's the point here. It means it's not in the original language. It's there for an interpretation. It's there for to make it make sense for us because it's talking about the gifts. Okay, but look at it this way. Follow after love and desire spiritual. Our desire should be a spiritual walk. We walk in the spirit. We live in the spirit. We don't want to live in the flesh. We don't want to live in our natural man. We don't want to live carnally. To grow, to grow in Christ, we need to walk spiritually. We because you are a spiritual being now. You have been made alive spiritually. You were dead and now you are spiritual. You are now able in John 4 to partake of living water. Okay, so you are now alive, spiritually alive. It allows you to have communication with God. That's amazing. We can receive spiritual things from God. We can hear spiritual thoughts, spiritual words, spiritual intake. Everything in this book is spiritual. And when we read it, our spiritual man comes alive because it's it's the heart of God. So desire spiritual. Um, Sunday, we spoke about a topic of human desire, my own desire which is not spiritual. The things that I want to see happen, the things I hope happens, but it's all uh, all a worldly or earthly desire. It's the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and it's the pride of life. And we all get them. But other spiritual things should take the, uh, should should overrule our uh, fleshly desires. These desires here are spiritual. So there's another desire. 
And that desire is after spiritual things. Are we desiring, are we going after spiritual things? So um, the word means zello, and it means a burning for. Do you have a burning within your heart for things that are spiritual? That's beautiful. That's amazing. And God, if, if not, yes, yeah, set it on fire. Set me on fire for you, God. Let me see spiritual things. Let me have spiritual discernment. Let me, um, uh, uh, you'll witness to people in the spirit. Too many times the flesh is coming along and we've got to make sure that it's, it's in its proper place. My mother told me that, I'm going to put you in your place and wait till your day. You know, but there is a place for the, for the flesh and that's in the ground, dead crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. Um, so, because when I'm dead, then I'm raised to life. And when I'm raised to life, I can listen and hear spiritual things with great spiritual discernment. And that's a, that's a beautiful thing. Okay, so, so he says, follow after this love and desire burn for spiritual. And then it says, that you may prophesy. Now, what is this word? Because this is interesting. This is an amazing word. Now, this is, um, so in, in prophecy, you had the Old Testament prophets. So you've got those that um, foretold. You can foretell. That ain't spelled right. Ooh, erase that. Get up here, Jess. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm not even gonna write it. You know, usually what I do if I don't know how to spell it, I'll say like it, like, like that. You know, so foretell, yeah. Uh, so um, nobody can say you you spelled it wrong. Because I heard somebody got a call. By the way, you spelled that wrong when you wrote it. Not not to me. Somebody, it's another. But so there's um, um. Uh, it, there's um. Forth telling and there's foretelling in the Bible. So it's um, when you foretell, it's, it's, it's future events. Like that's what the Old Testament prophets, they foretold of the coming of Christ, foretold of the Messiah coming. Yeah, and when he shall come, he will, you know. So it's, it's all these prophets and thus saith the Lord, you know. Um, and then even now, um, they're, some believe, modern-day prophets. But here it talks about prophecy, and this is for the church. But when uh, somebody comes up and says they are a prophet, uh, most scholars believe that Jesus Christ did all the prophecy that we needed, and when the Bible was put into play, there's no more need to say, thus saith the Lord, because we have it. Okay, so... Um, so anyway, with this the modern day prophecy, I want to look at here. Um, so really prophecy is just, um, profe uh, professing the, the nature, um, and telling about the nature of Christ and speaking of him, because this is really what the word is doing to us. Um, verse two, it says, for he that speaks now, for he who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. For no man understands him. Howbeit in the spirit he speaks mysteries. So here's somebody who's speaking in tongue, but man doesn't understand it. So what good is it? What, what does it profit? Really, he's saying prophecy can profit people and tongues cannot because it doesn't edify me. It does, I don't even know what's being said. And, and, and think of this, this word here, um, tongue. Here it is in the singular. In the book of Acts, it's in the plural. But it's, it means language. 
So he who speaks in an unknown language, you know, you start speaking Spanish, some people don't know, they're not going to know what you're saying. You're not doing anything for them. And same thing with English if they don't understand it. So understanding is very important when it comes to the Word of God. And um, this is why even with our Spanish people, they, you know, I want, I really go, I want to make sure they understand. And so we're going to do whatever we can to make sure that they get it and they understand. But let's, um, let's, let's look at this. Look at, um, look at Acts chapter 2 just for a minute. I want to show you something here too concerning this gift of tongues. Okay, so verse 3, verse 4. Acts 2, verse 4, right, it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak with other tongues, other languages, right? They spoke other languages. The people that spoke heard it in their own language. And, and that's what the miracle is, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, a couple things here. Okay, it says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. It's amazing how what this filling means. What does it mean when they were filled? But what it did, the filling allowed them to hear it in their own language. That's what the filling was for. So they could hear in their own language. That was tongues at this time. So, oh, and by the way, so it says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Not alone this is the filling of the Holy Spirit, but it's also the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say it here, but it does say it, if you take a notes, in Acts 1, Acts 1, four and five this is jesus saying to telling them to wait for the promise and look what he says and being assembled together with them he commanded them that they should not depart jerusalem but wait for the promise of the father which you have heard from me and in verse five john baptized you with water but you're going to be baptized with the holy spirit not many days after. So the, this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit that we're reading upon, even though it doesn't say the baptism. This isn't water baptism. This is what we spoke about earlier, right? So, so that's what that means. They're, they're baptized that way. Um, also, Peter confirms this Pentecost event if, if you need another verse, it's Acts 11. Um, and, he, and he's telling the story, and he says, and as I began to speak, he's telling about what happened in this Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit fell on them as he did on us in the beginning. And remembered I the word of the Lord, which said, John indeed baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So he says the same thing to confirm that. So Acts chapter 2 is not just the filling of the Spirit, but it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Got it? Okay. Let's, um, and if you don't know what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is, you need to go back to one of the earlier classes because we covered Three classes on that. All right? All right, so now, um, okay, back to Corinthians, right? 14. Okay, so now what I wanted to make uh, on that is, so in the book of Acts, we have three different positions of when they spoke in tongues. Three different separate things that the book of Acts records. 
One of them is here to the nation of Israel. That was Pentecost. The second one happened in Acts chapter 10, verse 46, at Cornelius' house, where him and his family received and they spoke in tongues. What's the difference between Cornelius and the nation of Israel? Bingo. Cornelius was a Gentile. So now the exact same experience that happened in Pentecost now happened to the Gentiles. Okay? So that's when, that's when tongues comes up again for the second time. And, and that's pretty amazing to think about it. Because the whole thing with Peter was unclean. Remember? That the Gentile, but no, this was the engrafting in of the Gentiles. To, and they were, and the, and the, the Jews, the Gentiles received the exact same baptism and the evidence of it, which was tongues, that the Jewish people received on the day of Pentecost. And then the third time in Acts, the only other time it's mentioned in that Bible is in Acts 19.6, in the book of Acts, and that is uh, with the church of Ephesus. And now this is a meaning of the gospel going into all the world. So you got the Jew, the Gentile, and the uttermost parts of the world. With the exact same way, the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the speaking of tongues as the evidence of that miracle of God. Okay? Makes sense? You got it? Okay. So... Um, okay, so again, verse 2, for he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men. Uh, and, then, and then this bottom part, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. It's a mystery because nobody understands it. You're speaking in tongues, I have no clue. And this is why the interpretation of tongues comes next. But what we see a lot now is there's no interpretation. So it, it questions of what this is. And to me, it's, it's just a lot of babble, you know, because everybody's doing it at once. It's not, even, it's not even once with an interpretation of understanding. And there's even an approach out there, there's a saying that if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. Well, I just showed you what it is to be saved. It has nothing to do with tongues. Tongues is supposed to be a gift at that time to show what was going on, in my opinion. But, uh, but amazing, because you know they'll come down hard on you. If you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. And there's no evidence of that in the Bible at all. Okay? So... So understanding is more important than not understanding and, and hearing and not understanding. How can I understand what God is speaking to me, encouraging me, edifying me if I don't understand? So th that becomes important. Um, all right, so verse 3, okay? Now, again, now he goes back to prophecy again. I mean, he, he's going to bring up tongues all through this chapter, but he's going to come back and say, this is better. So this is what I think modern day prophecy is. It's not the prophet. It's not the prophet that can only hear from God. I, I, I mean, I don't think that's, I think that's one of the ones that passed with this time. But it, again, it was needed. But look, at this is how I see it. Verse 3, but he that prophesies speaks unto men. So now prophesying is speaking unto men. What, speaking what, by the way? Yeah, well, before that, speaking the word. Speaking the word of God. That, when you speak the word of God from the book, it's, it's a form of prophesying. It's prophecy. It's modern day prophesy. I don't need somebody to come and, you know, say all these things and put it this way. If I'm in a church filled with people and I go, 
Oh, the Spirit of God is telling me somebody's got a backache here. I'm going to hit it somewhere. Somebody's going to have. Somebody's going to get up limping, you know. So it's not hard to cover all that, and um, and we got to be very. We need discernment in spiritual gifts because um, this makes it pretty clear. So he that prophesies speaks unto men. So this is speaking the word of God now for edification exhortation and comfort these three things and this to me these three words are amazing to me so speaking the word of god for edification oki oki domai o i k o d o m e in the greek it means to build up so your words should build up. Are your words building people up? That's edification. When what I say encourages the other people and builds them up. It is, this is a work of God of building somebody else up. Not for you. God will take care of you. We're talking about to others. Your words to others is edifying it's building them up they could have been they could have had a miserable day they could have had a tough tough going they could have they could be down they could be depressed they could be you know just heaviness and you give them a word and it just you ever you ever been like that you ever have somebody say something and just you just come like right out of it that's that's a a word of edification. That's a word of edification. When you give a word to somebody else of edification, that's prophecy. So, um, and what's it doing? What's the purpose of edifying? Is you're promoting growth in a person. You're bringing them closer to Christ. You're delivering them right unto God. You know, and you do it through a word of God. You know, and, and that's so beautiful. The next word is um, exhortation, paraklesis, P-A-R-A. Anytime you see the word para, it's usually related to the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. This is the same type of word. P-A-R-A-K-L-A-Y-S-I-S. Uh, -A -A and um, so exhortation means you're same again, words, you're, you're saying words to somebody before you're edifying, now you're exhorting them. And in doing that, you are, it's calling them near. You're bringing them near to Christ. Maybe they've drifted, maybe they've gone away, maybe you don't see them for a while. Time to, time to exhort them. Time to give them a call and exhort them so they can come near again. You know, that's amazing. The the invitation to come unto me is always what Christ is saying. And now he's using you to do that with somebody. Bring them near. Bring them into the church. Bring them in to get washed and cleansed and to hear and, and, and to be edified and be exhorted. So you're calling them near uh, with encouragement um, behind it. So the encouragement which, which pushes me to God. And what, when we hear... Christ call us, we're encouraged. When Sunday comes, you should be encouraged to be in church because you're, you're going to be edified and you're going to be exhorted through the Word of God. The Word of God just does it. It's an it's amazing process. It's incredible. That's why if you read all the Psalms, you'll hear David just going, oh my gosh, it's so deep, the pit, the miry clay, I, I can't take it. And then all of a sudden, Oh, man, God. Oh, wow. And he's, you can hear him like getting excited. Like he goes from one point to another he, he, because he's been edified and exhorted by the word of God. It's beautiful. Yes, amen. Third word, uh, uh, comfort. Comfort's a great word as long as it, it's not about you. <laughs> um, because we want comfort, you know. But comfort is not my God. 
Comfort is a lie, really. But we all want it. I mean, uh, Pastor Schaller gives that example beautifully all the time. He's going like, he's driving home, and the only thing he pictures is his lazy boy chair. That's all he wants is that chair. He wants nothing else. And all of a sudden he comes in and the wife's saying, oh, you got to do this, 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 this. And all these, no, I don't want that. I want comfort. You know, and, and we do. The flesh always wants this. But godly comfort is amazing. The word, P-A-R-A, para, mythia, M-Y-T-H-I-A. Um, this word means to address them through the word of God, that calms them down. Ain't that beautiful? That's comfort. Your words can calm people. Your words can just remove the mood. Yes, it removes the atmosphere and the mood that they are in, which is real to them. It might not be, but I'm feeling it. If I'm feeling it, it's real. So we're speaking to the atmosphere, and it just settles us. It just settles my soul. You know, it, 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 you know, oh, you know, what, how's that? Um, com, uh, comfort, uh, yeah, I don't know, whatever. I'll look it up later. Uh, but, but it's a word like that about uh, David is saying, Lord, oh, just let my soul just be comforted, you know. So calm them down. It's, it's like you're consoling them. You're giving them smooth, th- you're making things real easy, but it's the word of God that's doing that. It's an incredible thing. So three amazing words for believers to share with others. Edification, exhortation, comfort. Amen? Ain't that good? Verse uh, four, let's pick it up. Okay, so he that speaks, and, and now he goes back to that tongue yet. Look at this. He who speaks in an, in, in an unknown language or unknown tongue, edifies himself. But he that prophesies edifies the church. What a difference. You know what? So there, this is like a gift. I mean, so in tongues, you're edifying yourself. I, <laughs> doesn't that sound selfish? I mean, I'm only worried about myself. I'm only worried about edifying me. And God say, no, edify others, prophesy, uh, encourage them, edify them, comfort them. No, I'm just going to stay here in my own little world. You know, it's a very selfish gift. It's a very selfish gift. And people are saying that's the greatest one. And boy, is that a mistake. It really is. uh, Yeah, so, but it's a selfish kind of gift. But prophesying and teaching edifies even a group. That's amazing. Just your words, just a word of encouragement can lift somebody up because you don't know what what they're going through. You never know what somebody's going through. So that's a, that's a pretty uh, crazy thing. Okay, just, uh, just a couple more uh, verses. Go to uh, verse 10, and we're going to take this to 12, and we'll be done. Um, okay, it says in verse 10, it says, There are... It may be so many kinds of voices in the world. Boy, are you hearing a lot of voices? Now, this word is languages. So there's a lot of languages in the world. A lot of languages in the world. And none of them is without significance. They're important. Language is important. It's how people in different areas communicate with each other. Communication is the key. It's the lost art. It's what Satan is taking away from people. There is no more communication. I'm texting instead. You know, but send, send, send. I, I, I had to tell Chrissy this week, I go, can I just call you? Because I can't even keep up with what you're doing. There's like nine of them before I just answered yes, you know. But, um, but yeah, so, you know, none of them are without significance. So that's a, a good, but now look at, look at verse, um, 11. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the language, I shall be unto that <laughs> speaking a barbarian. It's like I'm, I, I, you know, it, it's, it's like a language that's just nothing to me. 
I might as well just be a barbarian. I mean, Paul's amazing with his words, right? I mean, I think last week, what was it? Ignorant, you ignorant, and all this. I mean, he, Paul's just letting it rip, man. I love that. Um, but you speak a barbarian. And look at this. And he that speaks shall be a barbarian unto me. I'm a barbarian trying to understand it, and he's a barbarian speaking it. This is what Paul's saying about tongues. That's incredible. It's, it's just amazing things here. Um, verse 12 in closing, and this is, this is good. Even so, are you liking this uh, teaching today? Is it good? I mean, I mean I, 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 again, I mean, to learn to edify without even somebody edifying you back. How's that? You know, sometimes oh, I'll say something, but they never say not nice to me. It, you're missing the point. It has nothing to do with that. Just keep doing it. Keep doing it. Because that's the gift. That's the gift. Verse 12. Even so you, for as much as you are zealous of spiritual, remember, gifts is in italics, right? So, <laughs> hey, you should be zealous of being spiritual. A zealous spirit to be spiritual. That's amazing. A zealot is something that just goes after it. You know, very strong convictions. This is what we want in our spirituality. Um, so go after the asset. If you don't have a gift, and you do, but if you don't, ask God and he will give it, it says. That's simple. Just ask. Ask of him. Ask of him even for wisdom. Ask him for spiritual things. Ask him. Your father will give him. Um, okay, zealous of spiritual gifts. And that's good. You put it in parentheses, right? Yeah, and that's, that's really correct. And then look at that. Seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. We should excel in these things we should excel because it benefits the entire church your gift that god has given you freely benefits the entire church and the entire church becomes edified by it that's this prophecy to me that sounds like you know what he's talking in this so that that was a conclusion of tongues <laughs> And to me, it was more about prophecy as being the centralized gift that the church should seek after and go after more than anything. You'll find out there's a, next week it's more because it's gonna, love is going to be even above that. Seek after love. That's the best gift. And so we're going to probably break that down for a couple of weeks and then, um, and then we're done uh, for the class. So... Um, and those will go into taking the final. <laughs> no, it's... <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you. We love you, Lord. And wow, thank you for this teaching. And you know what? Everyone here can, if you are saved and born again, you can edify, you can exhort, and you can comfort those that um, ask God, God, who needs to be comforted? Who needs to be exhorted? Who, who, who now? Who can I call that I can edify and build up? And there's many. There's many that are suffering. There's many that are weak. It says, the Bible says, there's many that are weak in their faith, Lord. And there are many that are even feeble-minded, their their minds are uh, can't hold and can't contain uh, your word. So, Father, just give us compassion and a zeal for this gift, Lord, and let us love the body of Christ. And we just praise you and thank you, and let us have a great rest of the week. And Saturday prayer at 10 o'clock. We'll be here if you guys want to pray. Even if you can't go outreach, come and pray at 10 Come and pray for a little bit and, and, um, and be built up and edified. Amen. God bless you.